Yeah, thanks, Harry. Uh, EastCoastHorrorGroup.com. Go check us out. Uh, we have 28, 29 shows worth of panels, as well as ones from Cinema Wasteland, Horror Realm, and Scaricon that we've worked with. Uh, so go check us out. Check us out on YouTube, East Coast Horror Group. Uh, with all that being said, uh, thank you all for coming to Days of the Dead, the final one here at the Wyndham uh, before we move on to another hotel. So with that being said, uh, thank you all for coming to this panel, and uh, let's bring out the cast of Twin Peaks. Let's start with Ray. Ray, Cheryl, Harry, and Kimmy, come on out. some time out to uh, speak with us today. We appreciate it. Uh, just to start out with a, an easy question, we'll just go down the line. How did you guys get involved in the series? <laughs> That's not an easy one. Uh, we got cast. Is that what you mean? <laughs> well, I met David Lynch. I was his driver to the Roy Orbison Memorial, and we had a nice chat that evening about acting. And then I got cast. <laughs> I went to an audition. Didn't ever get around to auditioning. I just talked. <laughs> that was it. Yeah, same here. I I just went and met him. I was living in Seattle, and uh, he just asked me questions about being put in freezing cold water and wrapped in plastic and how I would feel about that. <laughs> and then that was, then it happened. I said I, I was fine because I had grown up in Colorado swimming in freezing cold snow glacier lakes, so I was used to cold water. Oh, uh, well, you don't ever audition really for David. He just uh, wants to meet you and talk with you a little bit. And, and uh, he, he makes pretty snap decisions about people. And, and uh, if he likes you, then you know, you'll find out a couple of days later and you'll maybe be offered a part. So. We talked about our first cars that we had. I think his was a Volkswagen Beetle. And I had, a, I had a 1960 Alfa Romeo convertible that I paid $1,100 for back in 1965. Red. Red with a black top. A really chick mobile. <laughs> that was the phrase at that time. And, uh, and yeah, it was. I mean, girls like to ride in that car. But then, uh, you know, Parts started going bad on it, and um, it was very expensive to replace, and so I finally just jumped it all together and got, got something more sensible. A Honda. <laughs> oh, am, am I rambling on? I'm sorry. <laughs> I said a Honda. Oh, a Honda. No, I, I didn't get a Honda. No, I got a, a Plymouth Fury convertible. It was yellow with a white top. Another, an, a very nice car, another chickmobile actually. It was, uh, and it was fast, and uh, a, a great car until somebody pulled out in front of me in Kent, Ohio, where I was going to college at the time. They pulled right out in front of me and I, I hit them broadside. They were driving a 58 Thunderbird. And uh, it was uh, like cast iron. You know, the Thunderbird had, had thick gauge steel and my, my Plymouth just folded up like an accordion. The Thunderbird driver was just sitting there like, what happened? He didn't even hardly feel it. My car was totaled. Okay. So, what was your next car then? <laughs> my next car, oh. 
the car, the car that I really loved was my 95 uh, Chevy Impala Super Sport SS. Wow. Wow. It was, yeah, it was a beaut. And uh, I, I got that, and, I, and the first time I drove it was to the premiere of Mel Gibson's Braveheart. And it was at the Paramount lot. And uh, I drove in with my Impala, and I felt like a million bucks. What color? Black. Black with the big, uh, big tires. <laughs> Beautiful car. Where did the uh, 3000 SUX fit in? Huh? The 3000 SUX? The 3000, oh, the Sucks? We call it the Suckmobile? Yeah, we have those in Robocop. The, it's the little joke. So. <laughs> so, Ray, we had talked in Chicago uh, last year that you weren't really interested in Leland when you first read. Uh, Tell us a little bit why you weren't really interested in that role and why you decided well, to yeah, take I, it. Yeah, I thought that I was going up for the role of uh, Sheriff Truman, actually. And I thought, you know, I can, uh, I can handle the sheriff part okay. And uh, when, when I found out a couple of days after meeting with David that uh, he was interested in me for the part of Leland Palmer, I had to look back at the script and see when the hell that guy was. And I, and I looked back and I said, yeah, he finds out his daughter's dead and he cries. And, he, he goes to the morgue and identifies her body, and he cries, and, <laughs> and he's up in her room while the police are searching through her room, and he's crying on the bed, and so all this guy does is cry. But then therein lies the challenge. I had to make all these different ways of crying, different degrees of, of mourning, of, of being sad, and... Um, and then, of course, the, that character just sort of started growing out of that and uh, went crazy. Went crazy. Um, Cheryl, what conversation, if any, did you have uh, with David about playing Laura as a corpse? I mean, what did that entail? Uh, well, initially it was only about four days worth of work because it was the um, wrapped in plastic beach scene and a couple of those flashback videos and some photographs and and then it kind of went a little bit longer at that point but I stayed in Seattle because that was just for the pilot and that's I was dead so that was the end and then it was months and months later when um, he called and said that the show was going to go on and you know that there was possibly something else do. So, Kimmy, I, I saw a panel that you had done at another convention where you told a story about how you wanted to read a book on Tibet after talking to Agent Cooper in season two. Can you tell that story for us, uh, for this audience? The rock-throwing scene where Agent Cooper throws the rocks at the bottle after a name is read. Okay, everyone's nodding. And then I jump in the air and he tells us about Tibet. I jumped in the air, reflexive, and Harry threw the rock out of his hand when he supposedly got hit in the head by one of those rocks <laughs> and kind of wobbled and we a little. And then when it came time for Kyle to hit the bottle and break it, David Lynch said, all right, Kale, hit the bottle this time. So he threw the rock and did, and that's why I jumped in the air. <laughs> and, um, then when we were back in the sheriff's station, I said, well, we didn't have that much thinking to do on the show. I thought just a little bit, and I went, well, Lucy would be interested in learning about Tibet, because she just heard Agent Cooper, the day before, talk all about it, and David Lynch told me in the very beginning, Lucy knows everything about everything. And <clears throat> so, she's not a ditzy blonde, she just appears to be one. Really good. And so I said to the set decorator, is there a big book around here that we can write to bet on the front so she can be reading it when you see her through the sheriff's window, and the guy said, No, we don't have time for that shit! <laughs> Tired of you actors asking for shit! And we were like, 
We never asked for anything, like, ever, I, ever. And so I said, please, and he said, I'll ask the producer, Greg Feinberg. <coughs> and um, yeah, he of course said no. And so I said, David's not gonna like it. And um, David Lynch walked in, because he was directing, and said, he said, should Lucy be a book on Tibet? And David Lynch said, Aces, absolutely, where's a book on Tibet? You get a big book and write Tibet on it. You've got two minutes. <laughs> and then I got my book. So. What a bitch. <laughs> So, Harry, do you believe that Amy was the true hero of the story? Just say no. No. I mean, that's ridiculous. Like those t-shirts and those buttons that say, just say no. No, I mean, I, I don't think so. I, I, um, that's the hero escaping. Uh, no, I don't. I, I think I just happened to fall into some situations where I realized things sooner than others. So, talking with other actors and directors, uh, one that I always go to uh, in Martin, from George Romero's Martin, Braddock PA is really a character in the film. Now, Twin Peaks, sort of the town became a character. What are you guys' thoughts on that? Do you think it, the town and the setting was just as important as what? the people? Can I answer one time? Just once? Twin Peaks population 51,000 adds up to nine, and that's the number of the show. <laughs> so, uh, let's talk a little bit about David Lynch. Uh, he's, he's very polarizing. People really love him or don't really get him. Why do you think that is, and do you think he prefers it that way? I don't think he's, uh, I don't think that ever, he's ever concerned about that, really. Um, he's just a guy who just, he likes to do what he likes to do, and, and uh, you know, or the, let the chips fall where they may. I, I don't think he's ever concerned about that. He just, he just uh, wants to express himself and, um, for himself, initially. And then he likes to include us in on it, on it every now and again, and uh, when we like to take the trip along with him, you know. But he's not really uh, concerned about those sorts of things. Working on the show, did you guys get to have a lot of input on your characters, or was it very script-driven and that was it? Well, no. I mean, I, I think I think we all had uh, tremendous input because uh, I mean, the writing was there. The writing was. Beautiful. It was great writing, but you know, as with all writing, you, still, you have to interpret it, and and, uh, and through our own personalities, and and uh, and then you know, we, you you feel things, and you find things in the character, and, and you go that way, and the character starts to blossom and grow and develop, and all of a sudden, you've got a full-blown person there that's living in a little town having a lot of trouble, you know, and, uh, yeah. David Lynch would sometimes say, for instance, how would Lucy make sure the sheriff knew which telephone to answer specifically? If you redecorated the sheriff's station last week, <laughs> so that's a way he directed sometimes. Interesting. Um, so sure, uh, talk about playing Maddie and how that, that came to be. Uh, well, it was around the time when, after, after they had shot the pilot and I stayed up in Seattle and um, it was months and months later when he called and said, you know, I, I, there might be something else on the show, you know, do, would you have any thoughts about moving to Los Angeles? But I don't, I don't remember, he didn't tell me at that time about Maddie. He just said, I said, well, I'm dead. And he said, well, don't worry about that. <laughs> 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 
And uh, I don't remember the specific conversation of when and how I was told about Maddie. It just was, then all of a sudden, she was there. <laughs> uh, and which was creatively, for me, it was wonderful because also then I got to come keep playing with these incredibly talented people. Remember that really bitchin' house you lived in on Laurel Canyon? Like way out in the canyon with all those windows and your bed and that like sun porch. Oh, I love it. We had all the parties there. Remember Harry? I don't remember one thing about one of us, but... <laughs> Great. Do something a little different. I want to uh, take it to the audience. Uh, what questions do you have for these guys? Hi, thank you guys so much for being here. It's really a pleasure because I watched the original series back in the day. It was groundbreaking. It's changed TV. Let's talk about David Lynch. You know, he, I'm not a big fan of improvisation. Um, he said that recently in interviews. But how far does he go in directing? Uh, I, I've heard that he goes to the point where sometimes he will be really explicit in the way you deliver a line, or, or the way you're feeling a scene, and gives, gives great uh, descriptive direction. Could you talk a little bit about that? Uh, he, um, <clears throat> he never gave me any uh, line readings that I can recall. Uh, he came up, he always comes up with just the right little something before every scene that, that I had anyway uh, that sort of triggered everything that happened in the scene and uh, he has an uncanny way of doing that and he, and he does it very subtly and he's a very low-key kind of a guy. I, I rarely ever s saw him be upset when I when, and when the one or two times I did I was shocked by it, you know. But I guess we all have a breaking point at some point. <laughs> And we were shooting all day up in, uh, up in North Bend or, 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 with these big, for a fire walk with me. And we had the scene with uh, the one-armed man opposite me and uh, I'm caught behind the log truck and I'm, I'm in the car with my daughter. And uh, it was a difficult scene to shoot and I think David uh, became a little frustrated toward the end of the day. And he made, uh, Call him yelling at somebody for something, and, but I'm, I'm not sure who he was yelling at. But uh, I, I don't know. Um, did, did he give you any line readings? Well, I can say one thing, like an example. For instance, he said to uh, Deputy James, "Remember that cute guy who told us our son Wally Brando was outside?" <laughs> <laughs> He came in and opened the door and just, he's he all right now, James, I want you to open the door and just stand there and breathe. <laughs> I think that's what he said. <laughs> For a while. Just take your time. And then he came in and said, yeah. sun's up, and then we went, I'm ready, I'm ready. <laughs> So he does that. Yes. <laughs> oh, he, he mainly just blocked me, just blocked those things. But another thing he would do with me, he would always change a line right before they would roll. And he would walk up to me and get real close to me and tell me the new line. And he would act just the one line. <laughs> but that was it. But it, he always changed one line. I don't know. I don't know. It was, it was odd. <laughs> I saw Mr. Friend first, and we'll go around. Hey, hey. I, was just, I was just wondering if you could walk us through when you guys found out that the, the third season was going to happen, when you did it 25 years ago and you left all these great people behind, and you found out again, and it was your first day on the set, and you got to see everybody again. 
if you could just walk us through like how you guys felt about that. Mm. Well, I didn't see hardly I didn't see hardly anybody. I wasn't moving really very much, but but I did see uh, uh, Shirley and uh, Richard Beamer. It was great seeing him again, and of course Kyle. Everybody sees Kyle, and uh, everybody sees Kyle all the time, right? I mean, yeah. Um, but uh, as far as finding out about a third season, I, I mean, we were on the we were emailing and on the phone a lot before that actually happened. And uh, we had heard rumors, uh, you know, about it for, you know, a couple of years probably, and uh, we, th we tried to imagine what a, a, you know, a continuation would be, what a third season would be like, and, and I, of course, had my dreams and my ideas of what it would be like, and it didn't turn out to be like anything. <laughs> but it was great to see those two guys back in the sheriff's office. Yeah. And you know, what I thought was really uh, great about the third season was the way it ended. <laughs> On this lady. Yeah. Back in the Palmer House. I didn't really get to hang out with everybody either, because, well, Kyle, and I saw you crossing paths in the red room. But, because I was in, in we're all doing your fun together. Sheriff Station. Yeah. yeah. So you all got to see each other. When Kyle came in, he was the bad Cooper. The bad guy, yeah. And he came up and he said, Kimmy, Kimmy, Lucy, Kimmy, you look exactly the same. And I said, no, I don't, but thanks. <laughs> he said, you do too, but you're filthy. <laughs> Yeah, I walked through some fire. <laughs> Check. Thank you. Uh, yeah, this is for Ray Wise. I was just wondering, um, how did you uh, learn and process the information uh, after season one that Leland Palmer was going to be the bad guy of the show now? Oh, well, I never knew he was going to be the bad guy. <laughs> I, I, no, I, I thought, uh, I, always, I always just thought he was a grieving father, a little, you know, and, uh, kind of a strange man. <laughs> he, was, he, uh, he was a lawyer, but he only had one client, Ben Horn. <laughs> but I guess that's all I needed, you know. Chip and, magnet. Uh, I had a <laughs> I had a wildly <laughs> crazy wife who was, uh, to say the least, interesting to be with, <laughs> and certainly to act with. She's a marvelous actress, and and. Uh, it just blew me away all the time. Anyway, um, but I never knew that I was going to be the. I, I prayed that I wasn't going to be the bad guy. I prayed, and I don't often do that. You know, I was really praying hard, and uh, I didn't want to. I didn't want to be the killer of uh, my 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 daughter. You know, I I just had my own baby daughter in '87, and this was in '89 or '90. I think it was '90. Both. And uh, the thought of killing my own daughter was anathema to me. I said, no, I, you know, I, I, I had actually at home, when I lay my head on the pillow at night, had thoughts of maybe quitting, not doing it, because I really didn't want to do it. And then when, uh, when David called us into the room, uh, me and Cheryl Lee and uh, uh, Richard Beamer, Ben Horn, and it was, uh, David and Mark Frost. We all sat down the floor cross-legged. Because there wasn't any furniture in the room. We had no furniture. So we all had to sit on the floor. And uh, I think there was a lava lamp in the corner. <laughs> that was the only illumination. And, and we're going to get the word, obviously, of 
what's going to happen? And, uh, and then David leaned over to me and said, Ray, it's you. It's always been you. And I thought, oh, shit. No, 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 no. But he said, but Ray, it's going to, it's going to be a beautiful thing. That's one of David's favorite expressions, by the way. It's going to be a beautiful thing. And then he went on to explain that I would die in Cooper's arms, and he would be reading the Tibetan Book of the Dead to me, and then uh, at the end of a long tunnel, there was a bright light, and I would see my Laura at the end of the tunnel, and she would be holding out her arms to me, forgiving me. And he explained it so beautifully, at that moment that I, he made it all better, for me anyway. I didn't want to quit anymore. I wanted to do it as well as I could do it and, and, uh, and then leave town. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that, uh, yeah, well, I, I don't know how that works. I don't know how the Emmy nominations work, but anyway. Uh, They're all fixed. I think, yeah, they're all fixed. I think you have to submit yourself, is what I think. Unless the producer submits you, and they have to actually submit a certain amount of film on you, or, or some scenes that you do. And I wasn't hip to that, that whole process, so uh, I, missed my, I missed the boat on that. But uh, that doesn't bother me. And I got an Emmy l later on for doing a, a soap opera called Young and the Restless. Yeah. It's a daytime Emmy, but it's still an Emmy, you know. It's the same, the same statuette. Same weight. Yeah, okay. All right, who's next? I saw his name Hi, this is a general question for anybody, but what's, what's one of your fondest memories or, or favorite memories from shooting the series? I have one. I caught one. Oh my gosh. The bottle scene. Um, I was standing next to David behind the camera and he kept looking through the camera and it was the long shot across the field. And he, uh, where the chairs were going to be sitting but the camera had, was shooting from far away and he kept looking at the camera and he just stand back and he can't look at, he goes, what's that? And he's looking and Scott Cameron, the first AD, kept going, what? What are you talking about? And he goes, what, what, there's something, what's that? And everyone's trying to guess what it was. Everyone was trying to guess what it was. And <laughs> it was a stick, this big, sitting on the ground about 40 yards away. And he spotted that stick and for his, for him to compose that picture, it was aesthetically incorrect because that one little stick was distracting him. And I've never forgotten that, and it's just always impressed me and awed me that he saw that one stick. That's it. In the end. So it's all fresh and new to me, and I'm really just excited. And thank you guys for the work that you did because uh, that's the kind of story that just sticks to your bones. And I still think about it sometimes when I'm laying in bed at night and stuff like that. So thank you so much for all of that. But um, uh, what my question was, uh, is, for you, is, for you, is for you, Cheryl. Um, when um, you had to be made all up to look like you were dead, um, was that troublesome to your family at all? Like to people? Uh, did anybody have is, like trouble seeing that depiction of you? Yeah, I mean the whole thing, um, not even just that, but I just think the whole subject matter and everything was, which now that I'm a parent, I have great empathy and compassion for what my parents must have gone through at that time. Um, I'm not a, from a family that has any actors in it, so that already was all new to them. And um, 
And the only thing they knew of David's work before Twin Peaks came out was Blue Velvet. <laughs> so before I even started the journey of Laura's, uh, you know, I had sort of had to <laughs> uh, gently enter them into this idea. Um, when they met David, which they did, and David was so nice and so he's so funny and kind. He's a very kind man and very respectful and compassionate. They felt much better. But I think the whole thing for them, you know, as parents, is just, we know it's acting, but for a parent, they're, they're, it's still, it's a raw nerve that, that's being hit. I remember your parents' eyes were always like this. <laughs> Walking around the parties or the set or the, the Beverly Hills Hotel. Hey guys, but I was there when they did, um, when they, remember they took your picture uh, at the prom? Your yes. prom picture. Yeah, that's not my real prom picture. Yeah, that was all Please, let's get that straight. <laughs> <laughs> Please. <laughs> I am I'm a witness, and so is Dana Ashford. We were there, and we were doing that. We shot all night long. That was my first day of shooting. I think last. And you were there, and you, it was like, 3 or 3.30 in the morning and you've been sitting there in that outfit since like 11. And you were like 16. And I said to Dana, oh my God, the poor thing. She's growing. She's got to sleep. <laughs> and I came up to you. I said, can you, do you want to lay down in my dress? Do you remember that? No. It was like none of my, none of my business. None of your beeswax. Woman. I'm sure. I didn't say it was none of your No, but woman. you were a kid and I was an old lady. You I'm sure you it got was, it. No, I <laughs> didn't. I'm sure no. it was so nice. Yeah. You were like 17. No, no, I was like 19 or 20 maybe. Oh, 20. someone told me. Maybe that was Last American Virgin. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would have been appreciative of your kind heart. Oh, it was Laughlin Boyle was 17. Uh. <laughs> but she wasn't in the prom picture. You were. Uh, oh my god. Yeah. Do you want to wrap this up or should I? <laughs> This is what Kimmy told me to say. Um, well, first of all, I'm still processing that whole thing, which I think David really likes, because David likes people to watch things several times so you can grow into your interpretation of what it is. But I, I always like to tell the story about when I filmed that. And I was in Texas, and I got a call to come and film a scene. And I was told, you're going to be there one day, and then you're gone. And so my family was very curious, like, wow, that seems rather extravagant to fly across the country and do one scene and come back. So I went, filmed that scene, and when I came back, my family said, well, what was the scene? And I said, well, I don't really know, but I, I think my character is dead. I think my character died, and I really did. So. And then he called me, and I said, I'm straight. Yeah. He would never kill Annie. She's never. Lived, Kimmy said, if anyone's going to kill you, it's going to be me. <laughs> <laughs> right. Ready, I have one final question for you guys, and then we'll wrap this up. Um, with uh, Twin Peaks has been dissected, written about, talked about. You guys were in it there. What does it mean to you? It's a family to me. It's like a family that only they love me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Ditto. Uh, for me, it was, uh, I don't know, uh, in, a, in, a, in a way, it was everything. It certainly was at the time, and it certainly has been since. And uh, I just feel very uh, uh, fortunate and lucky to have been a part of it. You know? And uh, I wish I had just ended a little more in the third season. And if there is a fourth, I hope I'm in a little bit more than that. But I, I, I uh, will always be grateful to uh, Twin Peaks and, and to David and, uh, and these people will always be in my heart. Um, I saw Blue Velvet, and I've mentioned this several on several interviews, but when I saw Blue Velvet, Blue Velvet actually changed my life. It, it uh, transported me in a way that film usually didn't, except for the old, some, a couple of the old Fellinis, but I was really astounded by it. And from that night, I remember walking out of the theater and I, my body was kind of humming, kind of vibrating, and I was just stunned. And I, I knew that night, I was just like, I have to meet this man, I have to meet this man. I want to know about him. And then, you know, several years later, I was cast. And my mom's, my mother said, well, you know, of course, because that's how your life has always been. Uh, it's a, there's a couple things for me when I hear that question. The first one is, you know, just this group of people, like, like everyone has said, that there's something so deeply familiar that um, I cannot see them for years and then see them and it's as if no time went by. There's these unspoken understandings and just um, we've gone through a lot together. And so there's that part of it. And I also feel that it's been my greatest school because at a young age I got to sit at the feet of these masters of Ray and Grace and David and everyone else and I still when I watch their work in the new in the return I'm just in awe of the work the artistry of, um, and it's such unique artistry in every aspect from the to, from David's eye to the music to the cinematography to every department, um, and I, so I never, I never stop learning in that environment, and I just love that, um, and I'm very, very grateful for all of that. Great. Well, I really appreciate you guys taking the time. Uh, give these guys a round of applause. Great to see them.